afraid to ask the purpose or appropriate method or desired and attainable in a state for why people engage? What I was going to ask you is what changes can be made in our society to eliminate the climate of conformity so we do not find ourselves stuck in wars such as Vietnam or the current situation in the Middle East? Well, let me give you a quick example of, a, of an evolution in the American media that you may not be aware of and you should understand. Sometime in the 1980s, decisions were made in the media to turn them into purely business propositions. The media industries, if you will, were purchased by large corporate structures and entities. And the bottom line is what counted. Research staffs, large numbers of people who used to dig into stories, try to find out the truth, were fired. Now this has worked to a tremendous advantage since then to people in power in Washington. Because the journalist, best thing you can do with a journalist, if you're a general in the Army or the Marine Corps, an admiral in the Navy, or you're a, an official in the Pentagon, is to hand this man his story. Well, there, uh, Mr. Tom Ricks, here you go. This will tell you all about everybody in the Army. This will tell you what great guys all these generals are and what a huge success our operation is. Here it is. And he's under pressure from his editor. We've got to give me something I can publish. Give me something I can publish. Something the public wants to read about. And he's got how many hours before he produces a story? And he's got no research staff, no backup, no one to turn to. So what's he do with it? He generally reprints a version of it. So what the media is doing is feeding you largely what politicians and generals and admirals and others want you to read. You're not really getting the bird's eye view. If you get a journalist, I was sitting the other day with two British journalists, and this British journalist had been in the American Pentagon pool just two weeks ago with Gates. And this woman, she, you know, she said, well, Mr. Gates, you know, you're spending more money this year than Mr. Bush. And you say you're canceling some programs, but you're actually shifting money into others. And it looks as though you're trying to delay our departure from Iraq. Uh, could you please explain these things? And the other reporters who were American said, what are you doing asking the Secretary of Defense a question like that? Don't ask him something like that. That's not polite. And it went away. Because if you ask those kinds of questions to General Petraeus, General Odierno, Mr. Gates, you're eliminated from the Pentagon press pool. You, you don't get the free trip to Iraq. You don't get to ride in the Black Hawk helicopter out to the pre-staged event to talk to the specially selected soldiers. I mean, you've seen that here at the military academy. For God's sakes, it went on when I was here. You know? Well, let's, let's have Cadet Jones and Cadet Caldwell meet with Congressman so-and-so. They're two absolutely reliable ass kissers. <laughs> we, you know. And, you know, at the time, you know, this man just passed away, Lieutenant General Bill Odom. Odom was an interesting man. He, he was a full colonel until Brzezinski went to President Carter at the end of his administration and asked him to make him a general, so he became a general. But he used to teach, teach in the department where I ultimately taught later called the Department of Social Sciences. I know it's a favorite department here. Everybody likes it. You still have the social papers? There, there. Uh, anyway, I got a C on that damn thing. Any, anyway, uh, you know, Odom said at one point to the superintendent, you know, uh, we want to send these cadets over, and I was on the list. And I went to this thing, and the superintendent called back and said, you know, this man McGregor, uh, he seems like an impressive fellow, but for God's sakes, don't ever send him back. He, he, you know, he asked some very uncomfortable questions of the Board of Visitors. You see how we operate? It, it starts here. There's no easy fix, because it's not just West Point, it's American society. You know, how many inconvenient truths are there? How much money do we need to spend and invest how, to build new hospitals, to improve our educational system? Perhaps we need to change the educational system. I mean, do these discussions really come up in detail? Do we really tell the truth? No, we, we paper things over. And we've been papering lots of things over in the military since I walked out of the desert in 1991. It's a problem. It's not terminal. It will not last because this train is gradually
but deliberately slowing to stop because we cannot afford it anymore. And we're going to have to make some tough decisions, very hard decisions. What do we keep? What do we get rid of? How much money do we spend? How much money do we not spend? And so forth. These things are coming. And that's when you're going to see people emerge. It always happens. Whenever you are in a, in a strategic situation where there's no more abundance, where there's no more money, where there's no more time, that's when you get people of character. In politics, in uniform, they emerge and things begin to change. You're going to see it from the inside. Any more questions? Sir, Cadet Landrieu, if we do follow the British approach as you recommend, what do we do differently to avoid creating our own Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan? Well, it's back to purpose, method, end state. If I can give you three things to remember from today's discussion, remember those three words, purpose, method, end state. When you go out into the Army and you are serving as a platoon leader, you should get, in verbal form, not necessarily written, the, these written orders are overblown, but you should get a very clear, unambiguous statement from your chain of command that says, the purpose, method, and end state in this operation is this. After you seize the objective, after you arrive where you want to go, this is what it should look like. This is where you should be on the ground. This is your posture. You should be prepared to counterattack. You should be in a defense. You should rest and refit. You should whatever. These things should be spelled out, and it has to happen at the highest levels. So when someone walks up and says, gee, I think we should invade Iraq next week, we're sick of this guy, Saddam Hussein. Uh, we think he has weapons of mass destruction. He needs to go away. Somebody needs to say, okay, wait a minute. What's the purpose of intervening in Iraq? Well, we want to remove Saddam Hussein. Got it. Okay. What's the method? How do you want to do this? Well, we're going to use 150,000, 130,000 troops. Okay, what kinds of troops? We're going to use light infantry. We're going to use armor. We're going to use air power. What's the mix? And what's this supposed to look like when you get rid of Saddam Hussein? What happens? You put another one in. You say, Abdullah, you're in charge. You and Mahmoud, you run the place now. You screw up, we'll be back and kill you. That's one, one solution. Or... Or is the purpose, method, end state lead you to this pristine, Western-style, representative democracy where there is perfect human rights and the rule of law? Well, that's not going to happen. Not anywhere in the Arab world. I got news for you. Impossible. And what we have done in Iraq is replace a, Shiite or a Sunni Arab dictatorship with a Shiite Arab dictatorship and a new... Kurdish state in the north of the country. That's what we've done. We've done it in lots of different ways. Not necessarily in the interests of our friends in the Middle East, not necessarily in our interests, that's what you've got. And people paper it over and try to say, oh, this is very nice. It's not very nice. But there's a lesson in all of this. You can't go into somebody else's country, into somebody else's region where the culture is fundamentally different from you and manipulate it. It's an, it's an illusion. Now, you can pay hundreds of millions of dollars to your former adversary the way we have in Iraq. We've turned the sheikhs of Anbar province into multimillionaires. We've paid hundreds of millions of dollars to the people we were shooting at to cooperate with us. Well, you can rent them, but you can't buy them. And you can rent a Pathan in Afghanistan, but you can't buy him. Because his interests are not yours. His culture isn't yours. His goals are not yours. These are all temporary marriages of convenience. And that's really my point about not being dragged into things that you might not always want to do. So make sure that that objective at the end of that purpose, method, end state analysis is attainable. Not pie in the sky, not wishful thinking. It's got to be attainable. Any more questions? Come on, best command voice. <laughs>